Well, hello, folks out there on YouTube land. Got a big show lined up for you. Let's get right on into it. All right, folks, we're going to talk about the 12-team playoff contenders, and I'm going to explain the playoff because it's actually a little bit complicated. And if you're thinking it's just the top 12 teams, college football playoff committee will actually kind of manipulate a little bit, but it'll be the top 12. That's not how it works. Wrong, 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 wrong. No, it's actually much more complicated than that. And I know this video is getting out kind of late for a Friday, but as you know, I'm stuck at work on Friday. Drink it up, people! All right, drink it up, gambling. Yep, yep, Friday's kind of stink for me, but I did want to get this out as early as I possibly could. And it's actually going to change from the 6-6. Six and six. It was supposed to be the top six-ranked conference champions and then six at-large bids. But they're going to change it, I believe, to 5-7 and seven because the Pac-12 is toast. So they're going to present this 5-7 and seven model, which lowers the number of automatic qualifiers. This is by David Cobb of CBS Sports. It says the College Football Management Committee approved a 5-7 and seven model Friday that will see the five highest-ranked conference champions receive automatic bids, according to multiple reports. And it has to be approved by the College Football uh, Playoff Board. It moves away from the 6-6 six and six model because the Pac-12 uh, is toast, obviously. And what it does do, it leaves the door open for a non-power conference to make the college football playoff. Now let's explain that. So you've got the ACC, the SEC, the Big Ten, and the Big 12. They're obviously going to have their conference champions will be in the playoff. But there's going to be one more, and I'm going to show you what that's going to come out of. And I was having trouble understanding this, so I thought if I'm struggling with it, and I cover this crap all the time, 90% of folks are probably not uh, understanding it either. What it boils down to is of the remaining non-Power 5 conferences, and that's this group of five right here, which would be the AAC Conference, Conference USA, Mid-American Conference, Mountain West Conference, and the Sun Belt. Okay, out of that, the highest rated one that's a conference champion will get in. So why that matters is you might have somebody win a conference championship that is uh, – I don't know, the 17th ranked, for example. Well, they're going to get in. So part of this is kind of patting the head of the non-Power 5 conferences to kind of shut up and quit crying. So one of them is going to get in, whether they deserve it or not, which is 2024. you got to hand out participation trophies these days. So they'll just give them one of these millennial trophies, and uh, that should shut them up. So now let's talk about the deserving teams. And this is the 2024 Top 25 on ESPN. And I'm going to talk about these teams and whether or not I think they're going to get in. Georgia Bulldogs, they're pretty much a shoe in I can't imagine them not uh, making it. They've got Brock Bowers coming back. They, they're loaded as can possibly be. They've got Kirby Smart. They've had no coaching changes. Now, their schedule's not as easy as typical, but I think they'll at least be at worst 10-2 and two and they'll get in. But if I had to guess, they'll probably win the conference championship. That's just, you know, based on percentages. Next team is the Texas Longhorns. And they got Quinn Ewers, and their uh, coach is really good, Sarkeesian. That's who Alabama really wanted, by the way. That was their first choice. Second choice would have been uh, the Oregon coach. And they wound up with like their third choice, which is Washington, which, look, it's really hard to pry these coaches away when they're in good spots. So I think Kalen DeBoer was actually a solid hire for them. But Texas looks really good going into this because they have their starting quarterback coming back, and they're, uh, they're real solid, and they have uh, great talent. So I would say Texas is going to make it. So that's two of the 11. Realize there's only going to be 11 teams make it, not 12, because that 12 spot's going to go to the non-Power 5. So now the Oregon Ducks, I'm thinking they're going to make it too. Dan Lanning's a very good coach, and I could definitely see them uh, being at least 10-2. and two. So I think Oregon's got a good shot of making it. So I'd, I would add them as well. So there's three teams that have a really high likelihood of making it. Oregon would be the lowest of the three. Then you got the Alabama Crimson Tide. This is going to be super interesting. They do have Jalen Milrow coming back, but will he actually be the starting quarterback the, whole, the entire year? He's not really fit for that system that Kalen DeBoer runs because DeBoer is not all about running the football with the quarterback position. So it should be very intriguing. They've lost a lot of talent, but look, they probably had the most talent of any team in the country because of Nick Saban. And even though he's gone... I'd put them at like 50, 60% chance, whereas I would have had them at 95% with, uh, with Coach Saban. They might be as high as 60 or 70, but they've definitely dropped down a notch. They are not going to be as good as normal. It may take DeBoer a while to get his system going. Doesn't mean they're not going to be good long term, but this could be a difficult year for them. They might have some losses you wouldn't expect. 
I'm your huckleberry. Why, Johnny Ringo. You look like somebody just walked over your grave. And that could kick him out of the playoff. Ohio State Buckeyes, if they don't make it, that would just be a travesty at this point. And you could pretty much kiss Ryan Day goodbye. He would not make it through this. I can't imagine any way that he would. He's loaded with talent. They brought in a good running quarterback from Kansas State. Their wide receiver room is ridiculous. Their defense is fantastic. And they got Caleb Downs. That's not fair. Don't raise your voice to me. This year is critical. And they've also brought in an offensive coordinator, Bill O'Brien which is usually the last-ditch effort of a head coach, which is crazy. The guy's won over 90%. He's got to beat Michigan. Look, he's just got to beat Michigan. That's what it boils down to. Of course, if he beats Michigan, he's in for sure. But I think he'll make it either way. So anyway, Ohio State, I'm putting them in there with basically the odds of making it as high as Georgia. I wouldn't have them at number five. I'd have them at like two or three. Michigan Wolverines, this is going to be a tough year. They've lost their quarterback, J.J. McCarthy, their best running back, Blake Corum. I don't think they'll make it. It's got to be America's team. I don't. I think they're going to go 9-3 and three and miss out. They've lost their coach. They're going to have the NCAA all over them. They're going to be distracted. We're innocent. Although distraction didn't hurt them this year. It actually pulled them together. So who knows? Maybe it'll pull them together. But right now, I don't have Michigan making it. The old Miss Rebs with Lane Kiffin. They have a very good shot of making it. They've got a fairly easy schedule. Jackson Dart's a very good quarterback. He's also got other quarterbacks there that could fill in if he got hurt. They did lose Judkins, their running back, but they picked up a ton of great players. They picked up Princely from Florida, Walter Nolan from Texas A&M, uh, Juice Wells from South Carolina. You know, they're a transfer portal team, and he's won 10 games twice. So going 10-2 and two is very possible for Ole Miss, especially with their, with their very easy schedule. So I'm going to put them at like 60% chance of making it, and that's Ole Miss. Now we got the Missouri Tigers. And I'm pretty sure they do something about business. Yeah, that's very important to, uh, to Eli Drinkowitz. Now, they do have a key loss in Cody Schrader, who was a great running back, who they, I don't know where the crap, they got him from some little tiny college, and he balled out. But they do have two big-time players coming back, which is Brady Cook and Luther Burden, who are very good. And I was impressed with Ohio State, keeping them goose egg through – through three quarters with all three of their players there. They have a very real shot of making it. Um, this year, their schedule is the easiest in the SEC, and they don't have to play us Tennessee Vols up at Tennessee like they should have. So they may make it. I'm going to put them at 50% chance. Notre Dame fighting Irish. They brought in Riley Leonard, who's a very good quarterback. I just don't know about Notre Dame. Can they go 10-2 and two and make it? Maybe. I'm going to put them at 40% chance of making it. They're at 40% for me. Washington Huskies, I don't think they're going to make it. They lost their coach. They lost their quarterback. They're going to struggle. I think they're going to go 8-4 and four or something like that. I'm just not counting on Washington making it. Penn State Nittany Lions, the team that can't win the big game. They could sneak in at 10-2, and two, but I, I don't think they're going to make it. I just don't. They can't beat Ohio State. They can't beat Michigan. I think they're going to be just barely on the outside looking in, but, you know, they might sneak in, but... They're not going to beat Ohio. They could beat Michigan, though, and sneak in. I, I got to take that back a little bit because of everything that's happening with Michigan. So I'm going to, I'm going to put them at like 40%. The Utah Utes, I'm not seeing it here, Lloyd. Just I don't think so. We'll see what happens. They had a lot of injuries last year, and they got a good defense. I'm going to put them at like 25% chance. LSU Tigers, Jaden Daniels not coming back. Their defense was horrible. They're having to revamp all that. I'm putting them at 20% chance. I just I think they're going to have three losses or more. I'm just not seeing it. I don't know why they have a bad defense. It doesn't make any sense. LSU is loaded with defensive backs down there. They have so much talent in that state. But uh, it's just not happening. I'm putting them at 20%. Oklahoma Sooners. They're losing Dylan Gabriel, their quarterback. they got to play us Vols, but we're having to play at Norman, Oklahoma. I'm going to put them at like 25% chance of making it. They have a very legitimate shot but they're uh, going to be in the SEC for the first time, and it's going to be a rude awakening for them. I don't think they're used to having to play the SEC. They're obviously not. Haven't you noticed? you got to be a man to play in my league. So I'm going to put them at like 25%, something like that. Florida State Seminoles. My only concern with the Seminoles, and I think they would make it if not for this, I am concerned about DJ Ukulele, the quarterback they brought in that used to be at Clemson. I'm not sold on him. 
I don't know if that was a good pickup. That's my only concern with Florida State. They're playing in the ACC. They're they're going to be good. I'm going to put them at 50% chance of making it. If they had a quarterback that I was more confident in, I'd put them at 75 or 80%, but I'm going to put them at 50% because they're going to have plenty of talent out of the starting group that they have, and they're playing in a conference where they can pretty well dominate, and they have in the past. So I'm going to give them a pretty darn good shot, but not as good as I would if they had, you know, like I said, a really good quarterback. Tennessee Vols. I think the Vols will make it if Nico stays healthy. I think he'll they'll make it. They'll be ten and two. Now they're going to have to beat one of three teams: either Oklahoma, Alabama at Neyland, or Georgia. I don't think they beat Georgia at Sanford. I think that's one of the toughest places to play in the world. I don't see them winning that one. I think they could absolutely beat Alabama at Neyland. They did it the last time, and that was against Nick Saban. And I do think they could beat Oklahoma at Norman. It'll be tough. But they're going to have to win at least one of those games. And the rest of the games they should win. They've got Florida at home, Kentucky at home, and then they got a bunch of easy games. Arkansas, Mississippi State, and then a bunch of freebies. So I would expect them to make it. They do need to win one of those three big games. And like I said, Nico, I think, is going to be a terrific. He's probably going to be an all-SEC type quarterback, similar to Hendon Hooker. He might even be better. But he's got a nose for the end zone and scored four touchdowns in his opening game against a top 10 defense. So I really think it's up to how Nico plays and how well they protect him. He's got plenty of wide receivers. The defensive line should be fine. The secondary, that's the one big question mark with the Vols. It's been abysmal, but they did uh, replace virtually everybody in the secondary. And they did look good against Iowa, but uh, it's really hard to gauge it on that. So. We'll see how this plays out, but I do like Tennessee's chances. I'm going to put them at like a 60% chance of making it into the playoff, maybe 70. Clemson Tigers, I'm just not convinced on Cade Klubnik. I thought he was going to ball out last year. And Clemson, they had a lot of bad luck, though, man. They were turning the ball over in the weirdest times last year. And I was really shocked they lost four games, especially in the ACC, where they're just so much more talented than every other team, with the exception of Florida State. So we'll see what happens with Clemson. I'm going to give them at least a 25% chance of making it, though, maybe as high as 30 or 40. They're in a fairly easy conference, and they've got more talent. I just – I don't know. It's really how Klubnik plays, and if they can quit having all that bad luck turning the ball over like they did against – that Duke game was insane. I've never seen turnovers like that ever. They'd get down to the one-yard line, turn it over. Two-yard line, turn it over. Five-yard line, turn it over. So Clemson's had a bad luck streak. And so those are the teams that I think that have the best likelihood of making it. Of course, we'll see how it plays out. That's why you play the game. Hello? You play to win the game. You don't play to just play it. But that'll give you a breakdown of how I think it'll play out, the odds, et cetera, and how it actually works. Again, the top four conferences that are remaining, those champions will be in. Then one out of the non-Power Five, And then the seven highest ranked after that. And the college football committee will probably pick out of that. But remember, the top four get a bye. Then five through eight get home field advantage. And nine through 12 are going to play on the road. And in reality, it's an eight-team playoff where the bottom eight play to play against the top four. So you can almost look at it that way. But you're going to have 12 teams involved in this. And it's going to be unbelievably exciting, way more fun than the four came, than the four team. You're not going to have a Power 5 team go undefeated, win their conference championship, and not get in. That will never happen again, ever. And a team like Georgia, who loses one game against Alabama by three points in overtime, which is ridiculous, doesn't make the playoff. That'll never happen again. So I'm pumped about the 12-team playoff. I think it's going to make the season incredibly exciting. You're going to have to lose more than two games before you're out of it. So that means a lot of teams are going to still be in playoff mode well into the season towards the end. And instead of caring about a few games, we're going to care about every game that's a top 20 team. And it's going to be very exciting, and the playoffs going to be amazing. And I love the fact that five through eight get home field advantage. That makes that seeding very important. So the regular season matters a lot. And then the top four get a bye. So you can't say the regular season isn't important. It's super important. So anyway, I did want to cover this and kind of explain how it works because I was confused myself. And if you like this content, be sure to hit that like button. Let's me to continue to cover my Vols, the SEC, and of course, all these big stories and all this stuff. If you've not subscribed, it's on your right, my left. Hit this little button right here. It'll help you get my videos. Won't cost you a dime. And right over here is the most recent video YouTube thinks you'll enjoy based on your viewing history. 
We'll see you next time on Sports Talk Jay.